So we are going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us for the webinar, New York Gets a Green Light for Cannabis. My name is Elizabeth Aloni. I'm with Schneps Media. Schneps Media is the largest local media company in the New York metro area. We publish over 80 newspapers, magazines, websites, webinars, podcasts, and events throughout Queens, Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, Staten Island, Westchester, Long Island, the East End, Philadelphia, and now Palm Beach, Florida. We are so happy to be here with you today, and thank you so much for joining us. So we're excited today to talk to this panel of experts covering topics that many New Yorkers are interested in learning more about. These experts were recently recognized for being Politics NY and AM New York power players in New York's upcoming cannabis industry section. They include a top executive from a multi-state operator, a cannabis lawyer, a tax accountant, and a private equities funds managing director. Almost a year after the legalization of recreational marijuana, a significant victory for social justice advocates and cannabis industry enthusiasts, New York State continues to progress toward full implementation of the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act. Although adult use marijuana is not yet available for retail purchase, the legalization of recreational marijuana for those 21 and older has flung wide open the doors to a rapidly expanding market that is the potential to bring in billions of dollars in tax revenue. This incredible opportunity was a result of a collective effort. State and local officials, regulators, investors, legal advisors, and cannabis industry visionaries came together to guarantee that New York State and its residents will reap the benefits, medical, social, and financial of cannabis. The discussion with our experts will be led by Jill Carvajal. So let me introduce all of them to you today. First, let me introduce Jill Carvajal. She is the president of Front Row New York City and media consultant to Schneps Media. Jill is an accomplished media executive with extensive experience in international media and publishing. Jill founded Front Row New York City after her role at News Corp as the general manager of NewYorkPost.com. Jill under Front Row NYC worked with clients such as WME, IMG, IAC, Tribune, The Observer Media Group, and Hudson News on media startup initiatives in the US, China, Europe, and Brazil. Jill expanded her scope to healthcare marketing seven years ago to represent several prominent healthcare companies, including Columbia University Medical Center, the Northwell Eye Institute, and Bulletin Healthcare. Jill is an adjunct professor of media marketing and advertising at the City University of New York, Queens College. Jill produces a weekly podcast for CEO Josh Schneps of Schneps Media and is further developing the cannabis and healthcare projects for one of their newest media assets, Politics NY. Welcome, Jill. Now let's meet our experts. First, please a warm welcome to Patrick Johnson. He's a CureLeaf executive who's overseen the operations of CureLeaf in Connecticut, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and Vermont. Mr. Johnson has worked in the cannabis industry since 2013 and is the president of CureLeaf Massachusetts, was responsible for becoming the first operator to have five licensed dispensaries in the state. Prior to joining CureLeaf, Mr. Johnson held senior positions with State Street Global Advisors, Fidelity, and Ned Davis Research, while also co-founding two successful Boston fintech startups. He also spent two years working for Commonwealth Medicine, helping to develop the Prescription Advantage Program for UMass Medical School. Mr. Johnson holds an MBA from Boston College. Welcome, Patrick. Next, please welcome Elizabeth Case, co-chair of the cannabis law practice at Ruskin Moscow Faltacek. Elizabeth is the co-chair of Ruskin Moscow Faltacek Cannabis Law Practice and a member of the White Collar Crime and Investigations Practice Group. Known as a trailblazer in cannabis law, she provides counsel to businesses and individuals seeking licensure in the adult use marketplace by New York's Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act. She publishes extensively and lectures widely on the status and conflicts of law, regulatory compliance, and legal ethics in the cannabis space. Previously, she served as an assistant district attorney in New York County. Welcome, Liz. Next, please welcome Jill Scher, partner at Markham LLP. Jill is a partner there at Mount Markham with more than over 20 years of experience as a CPA. She's worked with large and small companies across a range of industries to streamline their tax operations and maximize state and federal credits. Markham Cannabis Practice 
group is one of the largest in the country, which gives Jill the tools to engage with the industry at every level. The cannabis business is subject to stringent and complicated tax rules. Jill is ready and excited to do her part to help the industry thrive, no matter how difficult the environment. Welcome, Jill. And finally, thrilled to welcome Mitch Barukowitz, managing partner of Merida Capital Holdings. Mitch is the founder and managing partner and he has nine years of experience in the legal cannabis industry and is considered a national expert in the diverse licensing regimes governing each state. Welcome, Mitch. Now I will turn it over to Jill. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for being here. Um, okay, so my first question is for uh, Liz. Uh, Liz, what are your predictions of when draft regulations will be published and how can businesses get ready for that? So thank you so much, Jill and Elizabeth. So great to be here and to all of my fellow panelists. I'm so excited for this robust conversation we're about to have. Um, you know, Merida passed almost a year ago and uh, we had great expectations that there would be a quick rollout for regulations uh, due to the, you know, financial robust um, marketplace that cannabis is uh, nationwide. Unfortunately, the rollout has been very slow um, and New York is trudging along through a very thoughtful uh, process. And, um, you know, the word on the street is that we should be seeing some draft regulations by the end of Q1, possibly Q2. I think that's still ambitious, um, but I'm optimistic. And, um, you know, there, there is a great possibility right now, uh, for example, for the Office of Cannabis Management to adopt some uh, preliminary laws that are right now in the Senate and Assembly that would give essentially like a provisional license to hemp cultivators and uh, e existing hemp cultivators that have had longstanding licenses in the hemp space. So there is thought and there is action with regard to getting a supply chain up and running. Um, in addition, we also have know that you know, the, the medical cannabis industry in New York will also have the opportunity to have uh, retail dispensaries. They are a vertically integrated um, construct. So there will be um, some businesses that will be, you know, sort of advanced in this space. What that means for the trickle down for the other applicants somewhat remains to be seen. I, I would imagine that uh, all of the members of the Office of Cannabis Management will be extraordinarily thoughtful uh, to approach this um, entree into licensure with, with thought and with care uh, to make sure that the uh, fundamental aspects of the social equity component and the small business owner would still have an opportunity to compete in this field that obviously also has a lot of finance and multi-state operators behind it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Liz, for that wonderful legal insight. I'm sure um, our viewers and listeners have plenty of questions in that regard. Um, so Patrick, thank you for being here today. Um, question for you. How can New York regulators support social equity cannabis entrepreneurs and foster a diverse industry? Hello everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, it's, it's a great question. It's honestly, it's, it's the kind of the million dollar question that all states need to kind of figure out. I, I, I would love for New York to look at like a state like Connecticut. So what Connecticut is doing is they're encouraging existing operators to partner with social equity applicants. Um, there's actually a, a, a conversion fee discount that uh, existing operators can take advantage of if they partner with social equity applicants. So in the case of Cureleaf, there's an opportunity for us to partner with up to six social equity partners, um, which will which will ensure that the program, when it gets stood up, there's going to be a number of social equity applicants, you know, ready day one if, if everything goes well. Um, and obviously, secondarily, a, a fund. Um, I love what Connecticut was doing. They were they were the first ones to mention that they you know they had a fifty million dollar fund where they were going to provide funding to social equity applicants. Um, I know uh, New York kind of uh, recently announced something similar. I think they were at two, a $200 million fund and most recently Massachusetts, albeit kind of after the fact, are now going to have a fund as well. So I think all of those things are, are very important for, for social applicants to be able to get a kind of a, a possibility to enter the market. 
I mean, access to funding remains the, the biggest hurdle. So being able to figure out how to make that available, I think is gonna be key. Um, and, and I think I think part of what, what I continue to try to um, encourage is right setting up the framework early on is super important and I know that the you know the state of New York has done a very good job on prioritizing social equity and obviously having a fund is great and, and being able to to kind of collect the money so honestly collecting the money is going to be easy from existing operators there's going to be a tax there so you know getting the money is, 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 is the easy part how do you then turn around that money and, and kind of make that available to operators whether it's areas of disproportionate impact or social, app, or social equity applicants, I think that's the challenge. I think that's something that Massachusetts has struggled with because I know they collected quite a bit of money for the first few years, but I don't think a single dollar went to social equity applicants or heirs of disproportionate impact because they didn't have the infrastructure in place to, to kind of put that money back out into, into the community. So as New York is looking to stand up this program, like I said, they've done a great job kind of laying out what they're trying to do. But, I've, but obviously having a framework in place once the money starts coming in and figuring out how it gets you know, doled out, is it, is it does everybody get $50,000? Does somebody get 250? Does somebody get 150? You know, who gets what? Is there gonna be some kind of grading system and application process? Is it gonna be a lottery? All those things are gonna be super important to figure out. Otherwise, I think the funds are unfortunately gonna get tied up and it's just gonna take a while to get those funds back out into the, into the community. So, so those are some of the suggestions I would have as far as you know, uh, trying to kind of help stand up the, the, the program, um, you know, from the ground up. Okay, great. And of course, uh, you know, it's a really critical part of the overall industry. Uh, we're very lucky enough, uh, as you mentioned, money and tax being a very important part of uh, the overall cannabis business. Uh, we have, you know, Jill here. Uh, so let's talk tax. And Jill, can you briefly explain how the cannabis companies are taxed so that we understand that better? Yeah. Oh, you need to unmute. Sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so thank you, Jill. And thank you, Elizabeth, for having us here. Um, and welcome, everybody. Uh, so the key to the cannabis industry and one of the biggest burdens is the, the tax. And that's because we all have to remember that it's still a Schedule One substance. It's still a controlled substance. And that means that for federal purposes, it, it's it's worse than any other industry. The, the tax burden is huge. Um, there's something called 280E, which we're all familiar with, or many of us are familiar with, where you can't deduct ordinary and necessary expenses like other companies. The only thing that cannabis companies can deduct is their cost of goods sold. This means that so many things like rent, uh, salaries, contract labor, storage, all these things are not going to be deductible on a federal tax return. New York State, we're still waiting to see how New York State is going to, if they're going to decouple from federal taxes. But when, when these businesses form, they have to make sure they're set up properly. They have to make sure that they capture their expenses properly because only cost of goods sold is going to be deductible on their tax return, which means that their income tax liability when you're talking income tax, whether they're a corporation or a partnership or an S corp or an LLC, when it flows through for those companies, the taxation burden is gonna be huge. So these companies have to set up properly to make sure they're getting their deductions, whatever deductions they're allowed to get as, as maximizing them as much as possible. So that's one thing we have to remember, even though states like New York and other states have legalized recreational marijuana, it doesn't mean that it's legal for federal purposes. This is a big burden to the industry. It's very important as companies come into New York State, they set up properly and they understand what the taxation burdens are and they do their best to mitigate them as much as possible. And you know, take advantage of deductions, set up their companies properly, do things in a in a in a in a, the, the most efficient way that they can. Thank you. Um as we've been discussing, there um, are concerns about how New York uh, will proceed uh, to, to do things more similar to other states that are um, getting it right as opposed to getting it wrong. Of course, money is a very big um, issue and attaining that. And so we have uh, Mitchell uh, Barukowitz from Mer Meridia Capital. 
And uh, the question for you is, what are the biggest potential issues with how New York is currently uh, moving to an adult use framework? And thank you for being here. Oh yeah, my pleasure. Um, well, I, I do think New York, as someone highlighted, I think it was uh, Elizabeth about the, the delay in, in getting rules. And I think uh, having been through maybe 15 states at this point, and we running operations, I think in 11 currently and owning one of the original New York 10 uh, has shown me that very often regulators try to over-regulate or make something perfect instead of borrowing from what works in other places. And I think New York, so right away, New York, they have proposed potentially having some preliminary shift to what, what they're getting right is they're allowing existing medical operators to shift so that you have some adult use commerce early on. Because if you don't do that, all you're encouraging by decriminalizing and creating a framework that no one can operate under, you're just encouraging illegal activity. So you're not changing the paradigm, which the whole goal of all of regulation, you know, from a macro level, whether it's New York or the United States in general, is to make all this activity legal. So it can be regulated, so it can be safe, you know, predictable, quality control. Um, you know, you think back to the vape crisis two years ago and people died of illegal products. None of those products were legal. So the whole goal is to have this legal industry that can be taxed, that can be regulated, keeping product out of the hands of kids, et cetera, et cetera. And I think New York, by shifting to uh, that transitional phase, will it, that's a smart move. Illinois did it. It was wildly successful. I also think, and this is going to be a little counterintuitive, while social equity is incredibly important, I do think a state like New York, it, the framework they're currently setting up is one that I think is fraught with a lot of danger. because. Typically, you want merit-based, you want some type of merit-based assessment process. What's the, what is the quality of your plan? Where do you want to put a dispensary? You know, and I think by de-vertically integrating, you're actually, op, you're, you're putting New York in a position to have a strong social equity component. But on the flip side, if you don't do merit-based applications and you just do lottery, you could end up with unscrupulous people, people who don't deserve necessarily even the money from the New York fund. What you want to encourage is a strong, a robust social equity substructure. And so New York has elements that seem to encourage that. But on the flip side, you know, some of the things I've heard about maybe a potential lottery, um, that scares me because in other states where they've done that, you know, you think of like Oakland and Oregon, where they've had to recapture some of these licenses because literally people can't get off the ground. It, this is a tough business. I think the perception, and I, I'm sure Patrick can chime in here because we've been in a lot of the same states, this, the, there's a perception that this is just an industry that has encouraged big, you know, big cannabis and that the 10 medical operators currently are just going to crush everyone. That is totally wrong. This is a very, very difficult business. The 10 operators in New York have worked really hard in a very narrow medical framework, have lost a lot of money, have spent a lot of money to be in a position where they can now shift to a more robust business. And so they're all encouraged, they, they, they want to all encourage the vertical integration. It's not just social equity. Anyone who wants to participate entrepreneurially in cannabis should have an opportunity. But I think people need to realize this is a very, very difficult business and that you have to have a plan. You have to have great advisors around you. You have to have people who know what they're doing. This isn't something that you just put a few you know, seeds in the ground and it just grows. This is an incredibly difficult, super regulated business, more over-regulated than any substance in the history of mankind. Okay, no one has ever had this kind of scrutiny. And I think when you when you factor all those things in, you have to you want people to succeed. And if you just pass rules and just start doling out money, you're going to find the 10 people or the 10 companies that already have licenses are going to they're going to be able to adjust to whatever happens. But the small guy, even if he's given money from the government, is not going to do very well. Okay, thank you. Well, to that point, uh, Liz. Um... How do you think that, or no, I should say, at this point, uh, that New York State will ensure social equity applicants do have a viable chance of success? So I, I really, um, I'm enjoying so far all the different perspectives on this panel. Um, and I think that so much can be taken from the examples that have gone before New York to try and implement and not get caught up in the regs as was suggested, but to really try and get this thing started 
it won't be perfect, but it has to start somewhere and it really has to start sooner than later in order to be competitive. Uh, and one of the, the overarching themes that we haven't touched upon, of course, is a federal descheduling and what that potentially could mean for a fledgling New York marketplace. But putting all of that aside and, and sort of getting into the into the weeds with the with the way that social equity applicants are poised to do well in New York, it's super important to remember that by New York making it a non-vertically integrated system, it, it is lending itself to the theory of mom and pop shops and small business owners having an access point and an opportunity. Because in order to create sort of the vast, robust, I keep using that word, but it's, it's really true in cannabis where you've seen these large conglomerate multi-state operators have the, you know, the sort of tens of millions of dollars of capital to create um, the system for, for example, one of the medical uh, registered organizations that is, you know, the the grandparent of New York cannabis. That that level of financial security to get something like that off the ground, even at a capital loss, is extraordinarily significant. Most social equity applicants will not have that type of funding or access to funding or ability to create such a large construct. So actually, some of the, the clients that I have, and, and I have from the full spectrum of the, the multi-state operator, you know, billionaire funding kind of client to that small mom and pop. Um, social equity applicant, the the theory that they can't put a few seeds in the ground and create a cannabis enterprise, I challenge. I challenge that. I challenge that for a couple of reasons. Um, because if the expectation isn't to become the next scion, the next cure leaf in the industry, the there is a different understanding of what that means to a social equity applicant to be in a participatory sense. That being said, of course, all of the tax structures, all of the compliance matters, all of the super uh, regulation that exists in any type of cannabis operation, whether it be, you know, a hundred plants in the ground uh, versus, you know, a million plants in the ground, you have, you have the same levels of regulation for the small scale operation for the big. But I do believe, and I hope, that the incubator programs that New York is set to uh, try to implement and um, utilize would be a, a kind of cooperative conversation or some kind of a, a connective of the sophisticated type of cannabis entrepreneur with the upstart. Um, because I believe that, that that is really the point, which especially in thinking about the, the, the uh, micro business as a business in the system, a micro business really um, you know, as one of the licenses that's potentially available is really curious to me. And, and what hasn't come out in any type of regulation format yet is the total canopy growth and uh, landscape of what a, a true micro business looks like. So in terms of like what that economic opportunity means to that, that social equity applicant who might have enough to do a seed to sale operation, but certainly doesn't have enough to utilize, you know, thousands of, of square feet of, of indoor grow or have the the uh, sophistication to do large batch product, you know, and the distribution and all of the rest of it, you know, it, it is sort of modeling uh, in a micro business context what exi exists in a legacy context. And I think that is something that, um, you know, not to sound corny, but really to sound, uh, you know, from the point of view of, of the regulators, it should be honored. It should be um, celebrated because that is part of what MURDA is to address. I, I come from this, uh, from a criminal law background originally, um, practicing criminal law for, for more than two decades, cannabis law for the last seven. But in my criminal law background, I, I put that hat on every time I sit down at the table of cannabis. Um, because, you know, I was in the district attorney's office in, in the Giuliani era when, you know, there was such over prosecution and such disparate treatment of people uh, of color who had, uh, you know, those t various backgrounds that would lend itself to disproportionate impact prosecution, jail, you know, collateral consequences and all the rest of it. Um, I, I think that New York really intends to um, have some very serious purist veins in the rollout of, of uh, cannabis marketplace. But that said, the, the already troubling um, 
first wave of what we're seeing is that in order to kind of kickstart this enterprise, we are going to see that a lot of non-social equity applicants will have sort of a first in line entree into cannabis production and cannabis retail. Um, so to your point, Mitch, that that lends itself to this gray and black market, that is part of the, the real it's, it's an institutionalized problem in cannabis. You have to have money to make money. You have to have money to be in a place to be um, a proper applicant. Um, but, you know, to lure people into converting those legacy operations into um, legalized ones is, is really that tricky space. And if New York is slow to welcome uh, the smaller business owner into the framework in the beginning, the fear is that it will already be monopolized, that their you know, business interests might still be better served in the, in the gray uh, rather than in, in the regulated marketplace. So um, yeah. it's certainly far from understood. It's extraordinarily controversial. And depending upon which group you, know, you sit with, some people are so beyond excited for the, the regulation rollouts and others are extraordinarily apprehensive and um, in some way downtrodden already by what they've seen come out of, um, you know, many of these, um, their, their regional conversations that are happening by the OCM. So I, I also would encourage your viewers, Jill and Elizabeth, to check into those. Um, they're still going on. You know, can I just make one point about what you see, what I was saying about popping seeds, what I mean by that is this is a very resource intensive business in general. Right. It's very hard. Like if, if, if it's not just about growing, it's growing, manufacturing, product, quality control, all these things. And I think the point I was making is that some people are passionate about the agricultural side and legacy or otherwise. It doesn't matter. The reality is that it, it is a complicated business because it's overregulated. It's not just like growing tomatoes, which need to just be clean before they go to market. Right. It needs to be processed and lab tested. There's a lot more that goes into the structure of cannabis because of its unique nature, because it's combusted and other things. And I think if New York doesn't put those, those, the scaffolding around the program, when you're giving less, uh, less sophisticated operators, so it's not about the entrepreneurship, we should encourage that. And I think, you know, if you look at other states, they've had a really hard time with social equity. I don't think it's about legacy operators, it's about anyone who wants to participate in, in the space, whether there's someone who has never done anything or someone who, who does. But this is not an in, this is not a business that really lends itself to like the half-hearted. I'm just going to throw my hat in the ring and see if I can make it work. That's what I meant. It's like you really oh, have and that. I, that I totally understand that, and I couldn't agree more. I guess I was just tr trying to take it back to that social equity aspect, um, which does sort of separate, um, you know, different groups with different abilities to jump in at different market points. Okay, uh, great debate. Uh, so, Patrick, um, since we were discussing also, um, you know, that medical cannabis businesses should be very well prepared to move into the adult use market, uh, what do you think is needed to have a smooth transition from medical to adult use? So um, I think, you know, as, 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 as already been mentioned, obviously, you know, the existing operators um, have an opportunity to kind of, uh, you know, create the original foundation of the adult use market by potentially getting this first mover advantage. I think, as you, as you mentioned, right, it's going to be very important for us to make sure we have enough medicines and the medical part of this to, to continue to supply the medical market. And then, you know, what's kind of left at the end of the day for adult use. So, I think there's a few ways to go about doing this. Obviously, we want to make sure we have enough supply, and that that is that that answer is already set. Like you know, the market right now can pretty easily supply the medical ongoing medical market, right? You don't you typically don't see a huge spike in medical once the adult use program comes online. It tends to be quite the opposite. You tend to be, you know, you'd be happy if you can kind of maintain the medical market, right? It, it, that all depends on on tax rates and so forth. But so I think it's going to be important to set up some guardrails to make sure that the the the, the minimum amount of product kind of gets safeguarded for the medical market. I think that can be done a few different ways. I think in Massachusetts, you know, early on, they, they said you have to set aside a certain percentage for the medical market. Once you have enough uh, sales for six months and you can demonstrate how much you, 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 know, you, you, you sell to the medical market, as long as you maintain that inventory, everything above and beyond can kind of be set aside for that adult use market. So 
So those things are pretty straightforward. I think that, you know, many states have that set, set up already. So as long as you have some form of guardrails that you kind of maintain and that the operators have to make sure that they can kind of comply with, I think it's going to be pretty straightforward to kind of make sure that the medical patients get the, you know, ongoing priority because ultimately they, you know, they're, they're the ones who need it, whether it, you know, you get your medicine from, from the, you know, the gray or the medical market. I mean, ultimately it is, I think we all agree that it is, it is a medical plant that has a lot of different benefits. So you want to make sure that, you know, that kind of stays as is. So, so I think that's key. Um, I think, you know, kind of to, to just kind of add to that. And I think this kind of goes back to what I think Mitch was saying too, is, you know, it, it's going to be very important, right? It's, it's to, 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 to build and grow is the most important. I mean, sorry, is, is these most cash intensive, right? So what, what people don't realize is, right? So, so let's assume an average cost per square foot to build a grow is about $500 per square foot. So if you're trying to build a, a pretty small grow, which is I think the micro business, you know, depending on which state you're in, it's, let's say it's 10,000 square foot cultivation, that's a $5 million project, right? And then you probably not get any plans out of that in about two years. So it's going to cost a lot of money and you're not going to get any money back for two years. So that, that's, going, that's going to be the biggest you know, hurdle for, for many of these new operators. What's probably the least cash intensive is either delivery or setting up a retail store, right? And I think to, to retrofit a store, you can probably do that on the cheap. I know when I got started, I did a lot of the painting and so forth myself in my first store. I, you know, you kind of work in the store and you do all the kind of decorating yourself. You can do it on kind of shoestring budget and that part is easy. Um, so I think there's different ways to enter the market, but you know, I think just to to kind of have enough supply to 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 kind of supply you know these new operators is going to be key, and uh, and I think those those are some of the things we got to kind of look out for. But for like I said, first and foremost, the medical supply I, I wouldn't be worried about because you know the existing operators can maintain that pretty straightforward, and now you know the existing operators are already trying to inc you know incrementally add canopy to be ready to supply the adult use market for whenever it comes. Like I said, it's going to take time. So, you know, I know Cureleaf is looking to expand its canopy, but you know, it's not, it's going to be a year and a half before we get any product out of there. So um, it just takes time and it's super expensive. Great, thank you. Um, Jill, so how will New York state tax uh, cannabis businesses since that's going to be such a big, um, have, have such a large impact over the, overall success for, you know, small and large operators. Yeah, so this is a big deal. Um, <clears throat> I mean, everyone's talking about the social equity applicants and, you know, how, how people are going to enter the market and these legacy companies that have been in the state for so long, are they going to come and become legal? Uh, they're going to have to look at the landscape of what's going to happen when they do become legal and the tax burden, among other burdens of, of this industry. Um, the first thing that New York State is doing right now is they're trying to decouple from federal 280E, which is all those deductions that you can't deduct for the cannabis industry. Perhaps in New York State, we're going to be able to have a, a, what happens is you start with your federal income. And I'm, I'm sorry to talk tax language. I'm, I'm the geeky tax person here. But you start with your federal income, which doesn't allow all these deductions on your tax return for the cannabis company. And then for New York State, we're hoping that there's going to be a modification, meaning that you get to deduct all of those expenses, your salaries, your, you know, your rent, all of the expenses that normally would be deductible for regular business. We're hoping New York State will allow this. Currently, there's a, a bill in the Senate of New York State. It hasn't been passed yet, but it is the it, it's the goal of the, the MURDA that came out that said that this is what New York intends to do. We intend to decouple from uh, federal 280E limitations. So we're hoping that comes through. But in addition to corporate income tax uh, on the federal side and on the New York state side, companies also have to consider the actual excise tax on, on THC. And New York is very, very different what they're proposing than any other state. They're actually going to tax an excise tax at the distributor level, depending on you know, what you're selling. So the, the tax right now is supposed to be 0.5 cents uh, for cannabis flower based on the, the potency of the THC in the flower. Then there's going to be 0.8 cents on cannabis con concentrate and three cents on uh, edibles. That's at the distributor level. And then when you get down to the retail level at the dispensary level, there's going to be another 13% tax, 9% of which goes to the state, 3% goes to localities, and 1% goes to the county. So 
there's a huge burden from the corporate income tax level to the excise tax level um, that New York State is really going to be sort of at a disadvantage compared to other states because, first of all, when you're in New York, the taxes, the corporate income taxes and all the other burdens of being in New York is tremendous. But now you have this other tax, which is on the excise tax, which is tremendous as well. And the way that New York is taxing this based on the THC level is very complicated also. We don't know how they're going to actually enforce this because it has everything has to be, you know, it's tested to see how much THC content is in whatever particular product that you're selling. So there's a lot of complications here. We're waiting to see what the legislation is going to look like ultimately. And um, we'll see what happens. Okay, thank you. Of course, with every new business, there's always uh, some pitfalls. Um, so Mitch, uh, what are some pitfalls in the current proposed laws for cannabis in New York? Well, I, I think, um, so I think both Elizabeth and Jill both highlighted what I think are just what any state would deal with, um, which are the biggest problems. The first is there is a fundamental existential question that any regulator has to have, which is how do I regulate something that I'm trying to make legal so that I can undo you know, the war on drugs and all these things, but how can I regulate it so that I encourage participation in the legal market, which is the most important thing. I think the, the goal is to have a legal market that everyone can participate in equally with um, from the revenue to also just getting medicine, you know, uh, medical cannabis as an alternative to toxic, you know, other toxic like opioids, just that alone, there, so that you don't have deserts where there's no access to CBD and other medical products, number one. But how do I pe penalize people who break the laws? Like you don't want what New York did with cigarettes, which is essentially you've made, you made the, the taxation around cigarettes so onerous that people just go to Indian reservations and the mob basically would drive trucks full of cigarettes off of Indian reservations and then try to sell them to, to bodegas untaxed. So you don't want that. You have to, you have to have, I, I, again, I think Elizabeth, I'll leave that to the lawyers. I'm a lawyer myself, but thank God, you know, I, I don't have to grapple with this, which is how do you penalize people who walk outside the one, once it's legal, what do you do to people who don't, who don't engage in that? Number one, number two, I think New York, what they've gotten wrong is the taxation. I think the taxation regime as proposed is insane. I think it's going to fail and I think it'll be undone, but it'll take years to undo because once New York does something, it's hard to undo. I think a, if you overtax it, you are encouraging illicit market participation. You're hurting the social equity applicants who have to compete more with legacy operators and bigger cannabis. So I think anyone who thinks the taxation actually benefits social equity applicants is, doesn't understand what happens in other states. The legacy applicant who wants to come to the legal market will get crushed by other legacy people who don't want to come into it if taxation is too high. Right. And it just encourages, again, unsafe products that aren't lab tested. If the whole goal is to have a safe, regulated industry, then you have to have the barriers to entering the industry as low as possible. And the taxation from just, just how much money I think you're going to have to spend on complying. Like I feel bad for Cure Relief that they're going to have to, they're going to need a new software that doesn't even exist yet to calculate what their taxation is. First of all, I own lab testing companies. I have 81 portfolio companies. I own something in every vertical in this entire industry, if not from data to you know point of sale to just everything. And I can tell you there's no way to comply with what New York's proposing from a tax perspective. There's no way. It doesn't exist right now in the industry. I don't care what point of sale system thinks they can do it. The existing back off uh, back end that they offer to all the 10 ROs does not in any way capture taxation the way so if you can't validate it or audit it, then what's the purpose of even having a regime of taxation that way? So I think New York would be very smart to roll back and think of it is this way. You can tax it with sales. You can you know, do a sales tax. You can do a value added tax. A THC tax is crazy. And maybe be more thoughtful. And instead of think of how much money you can grab, think of first how you can help the industry get off the ground. How about no taxation or no special taxation that doesn't other industries don't have for the first six months? Or the first year, right? The the concept that you can somehow, you know, taxing industries like this this way is like standing in a bucket and trying to lift it over your head. You're killing the industry before it even gets up and running. So I think what New York has done the worst in this proposed plan is a tax issue. Okay. Uh, well, to to kind of go back to Jill, uh, our tax expert, uh, what are these tax what what are these tax burdens? financially and what 
can companies do to mitigate these burdens? So, I mean, Mitch, you, you really hit the nail on the head. I mean, everyone's talking very applicable things and the social equity and everything, but even if we get past all that and we get everybody the licenses and we do it the right way and we roll this out, the truth is it's still illegal for federal purposes. And even if these legacy companies decide to you know, become legal uh, for adult use and, and turn themselves in you know, and, 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 and clean, clean this up, New York State can say, okay, we're gonna allow these deductions and maybe we could change the regime and, and, uh, and you know, not, not do it based on THC uh, potency and, and think of something better, but there's still gonna be a huge burden for federal tax purposes. And there's still gonna be a huge burden to actually enforce and, and comply with all the standards. It's, it's just unbelievable. And New York in general, I mean, I guess you can compare it to California. California is a little worse. The, the tax burden in New York is tremendous. You have the state taxes. And if you're in the city, you also have city taxes. So it's the, the burden is so, so strong in, in New York. So we have to do this right. Um, so what can we do? Well, this is what we could do. Right from the onset, we can have the right advisors, you know, go to the attorneys, go to the people that are in the industry for years and years and years and say, what can we do to set this up properly? We need to have the right systems. You need to have the right licenses. You need to have the right accounting software. You need to file the right reports. You need to capture all the expenses that you could deduct because a lot of them are not a deductible. And there's a lot that's subject to interpretation here, right? So what is cost of goods sold? Cost of goods sold is what you buy you, you pay for the product, but it's also, what if you're storing stuff in, in a particular uh, area of, of inventory in your shop and it has to be a certain temperature? Does that become part of cost of goods sold? What if employees are working, you know, transporting the goods? Does that become cost of goods sold? All of these, everything is subject to allocations and definitions, and you have to make sure you're capturing the expenses properly. So you can have the right software, you can have the right uh, ERP system um, installed, have the right advisors to make sure you're taking advantage of the deductions, and the math, you know, everything is fractional and percentage. You have to make sure you're doing the math. Uh, what else can you do? Uh, you could take advantage of um, anything that's out there as far as tax credits. Uh, you know, a lot of times I know, you know, in, 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 other, in, in other states where it was already adult use was already legal in, in 21, there was something called the employee retention tax credit that was part of the pandemic that cannabis companies were allowed to take advantage of if they were you know, complying, legally complying. New York State, it's not going to be applicable because the, the law expired, but it's important that you look at any tax incentives or tax credits that are out there that might be applicable to the industry. And uh, it's just, uh, it's, it, it, you have to make sure you structure properly too, right from the onset. When these companies are forming and they go to, to people like Liz and, and they say, okay, I want to form a company. My screen just went blank. Uh, when they say, I want to form a company, they have to make sure that they set up their legal entities properly. Maybe they have a company that is, um, you know, cannabis touching. And then they have another company that is uh, not THC touching, like the, um, the products, the apparel in their store and they could allocate a certain way. But this has to be done very, very carefully. So, Well, can, wait, can I ask a question to Liz directly? Because I just, Jill, something you just said just for, I mean, has anyone, Liz, you talked to more of the, obviously I, I know the people at, at the Cannabis Commission and, and in multiple states. No one has ever been able to articulate and, and answer this, but no one has been able to articulate why cannabis needs 14 different taxes on it. You already pay regulatory fees. There's licensing fees. Like when all the ROs, when you first applied, I think it was $200,000 and there was another fee. Five people, I, I know the people at, at Wentworth that were, you know, I know the people that reviewed, you know, Nicole Quackenbush and, and, and crew. 20 people worked on it. There's no way with 42 applicants, that's $8 million in, in application fees. Okay, mm -hmm. so that was $8 million to, to start. No one has ever been able to articulate why cannabis must be taxed at every level and every point of entry as opposed to how come Oreos aren't taxed that way? How come, I mean, so, you know, if you're in the room, who's articulating why cannabis needs to be overtaxed this way? Why it needs to be taxed at every level when we already have a sales tax, there's other, there's state, st the state knows how to tax things. So what has someone articulated to you? Because I, what Jill is saying, I, I'm making a much more fundamental thing is I don't think there's a software that even exists right now that could even do what New York is proposing to do. It, Which it, no it, one in New York cares about maybe, but in actual reality, we all know that when you first launch it, these software systems are just getting used to 
So New York's going to be a mess just because of if they try to implement this tax. So what is what are people saying in the regulatory room that we have to tax this because this has to be the biggest money grab we've ever had? Or like what's I, really going on? It's money grab, but it's more, I think it's more likely belts and suspenders. So when you have a federally illegal operation that's statewide legal, I think the states are getting away with what they're doing first and foremost by providing such a heavily regulated structure that the feds are saying, if you comply with your state's law, we will not enforce the uh, you know the, the laws against a schedule one substance. I mean, it, it really to me is as simple as that. And the more steps of regulation, taxation, oversight, compliance, all of that massaging of the industry would potentially give comfort to the regulators and the uh, you know law but enforcement. But that's the cost of operation. I'm talking about what are regulators articulating for the need? Like there's not a 20, name one substance that has a 25% excise tax on it as might be proposed in the COA or anything else. Nothing. I couldn't, I couldn't possibly other than to go back to the original premise of where cannabis is such a demonic instrument right. of commercial aspect, right? It's, so it's there, punitive. It's, I mean, it's, 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 yeah, and okay, it, it, to me, there is sort of this historical lens of racial, you know, racism bias as to who it, uses cannabis, who enjoys cannabis, and to um, potentially uh, squash or quash the marketplace. I mean, it really isn't something that the government can stand behind and say, yay, everybody go out and find another mode of uh, imbibing. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's against a government purpose. I mean, when I talk to uh, prosecutors now about the potential for driving under the influence of cannabis as sort of the new scary crime that's out there that exists. I, I sit right now in Long Island. That's a very real concern for a lot of people uh, when they review what murder means to local, um, you know, landscapes. That, that might not be true for for a New York City, uh, where you know most people have access very conveniently to public transportation or alternative modes of transport. But in the suburbs and in the sticks, where people still are, you know, driving fundamentally their own cars, this is has that other side of you know, side effect of it. I don't believe for a second that overly taxing something is going to in any way um, create an impasse to the marketplace. It just furthers and bolsters the the uh, the gray, right? And and so I, it's not going to change people's habits or right, where they're they starting from scratch. Though, see, this is this is what I find as someone who's been on the regulatory side and someone who's been an operator. The, the, the breaking know. point is going to be when New York State starts to lose revenue to their surrounding states. That's when you're going to see. But that's going to happen. I mean, given that's the gonna, way New York's gonna gone happen. off, they're gonna, right there. They could have been New York could have flipped the switch and already had the registered organizations split their counters, create a different compliance regime, and been up and running already. And New Jersey's going to get up and running first. Connecticut's going to get up and running first. We, Massachusetts, every half of Westchester that. County and Upper New York goes to Massachusetts and brings product back. But the, this is again, New York is starting from scratch. They have a a, a blank page, and and you know, frankly. The, the rules, the taxation doesn't, again, all of this compliance doesn't help social equity applicants who want, who are more passionate about operating and not so passionate. I mean, compliance. But neither, is but neither does, neither does giving the registered organization the leg up to start ahead of the other industry. I, 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 kind of, I don't think that's true. And you know what? I actually would argue that the goal, if the, if the goal, that is a, a function of reality, which is they are up and running, right? There, if, if you say, we are not going to let adult uh, registered organizations sell adult use. Then there is a two-year vacuum, no matter what. Like Patrick said, this plant doesn't grow. In, in it takes you have to build out a facility. You have to make sure you have compliance. Again, you have to be able to comply with the laws, whether it's taxation or otherwise. So you're looking at two to three years of nothing. Then, then, then you know it, that that's not a pragmatic solution. It's not optimal. But the way you can yeah. mitigate that is by saying we're gonna uh, we're gonna allot this many dispensaries. Remember. Registered organizations only have 40 places they can sell through it. New York needs 250 more dispensaries, right, Patrick? You can give all the dispensaries to, to small operators. Okay, now- New York will have, yeah. Right, New York's going to have like about, 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 about There's resources. ways to do this. Yeah. I don't know if that would be a solution either, because people who have lots of uh, you know financial backing would be very happy to own just retail. They're not necessarily looking for a vertically integrated enterprise. Sure. Well, keep in mind. I mean, I mean, I'm going to try to move on think, just so that we cover a few more of the questions. And uh, if that's okay, 
uh, just because I think there's some really important issues and I see some of the questions coming in and they relate to these um, general questions. Um, so back to you, Liz, on this. Um, let's talk about the effects of the um, municipal opt out of retail and consumption lounges on MURDA's overall predicted success. So uh, by December 31st of 2021, all municipalities were, were to vote or to rule in their own small um, uh, areas, whether or not they were going to allow for retail or consumption. Um, and so, you know, that verdict is in, we have, there is a list, you can refer to it uh, pretty easily on the internet. I think that that was sort of a frustrating aspect uh, to many to see how many municipalities opted out. But that being said, I don't believe that their opt out status will remain permanent. I think that one of the great logics of of many uh, political operations on the uh, down, you know, on the local level was we don't have any regulations. So how can we possibly say yes to this when we don't really know what this is? I think that will change when um, draft regs are, are uh, published and when regs are promulgated, that there will be more municipalities opting back in. That being said, you know, again, this is sort of a logjam, right? So on one hand, if it's a non-vertically integrated system and, and one of the side, you know, uh, one of the licenses that is non-vertically integrated is retail and consumption is blocked from actually being in these areas, what does that mean for the overall success of the program? Well, it can mean a lot of things. It can be that there's oversupply and where are we selling it? But of course, Murda did address delivery systems, which are not opt outable. So, um, you know, I, I envision in, in many ways that, you know, for me sitting here in Nassau County, where we have slim to no chance of having a brick and mortar store, we'll be able to uh, have anything delivered from various points across the state. And that could be its own robust industry for license applicants. Um, and, and to Mitch's point, it's a low, it's a, lower end upfront cost of entering the cannabis business to have a, an operation like that as opposed to a fully vertically integrated or, or uh, cultivation license. So there is probably a lot of opportunity for that. And I guess the less brick and mortar stores that are available, the more delivery companies will be seeking licenses to make sure that um, you know a greater swath of the state is represented in commercial enterprise. Okay, great. Um... Patrick, um, will Cureleaf and other operators be ready to meet the demand of the market once it's live? And then, do you think adult use in New York will help further the mainstream adoption of cannabis nationwide, if you want to kind of? Sure. I mean, I, I, I know part of, you know, a lot of the QA kind of Q&A came in about, you know, giving this first mover advantage to existing operators. And I know it's something we've talked about before. So I guess just, just to kind of give a quick history. So I started in 2013. It took me set four years to get my first harvest right in 2017. You know, I was bootstrapping myself. I had, you know, I was four credit cards. I was maxed out on four credit cards starting to get up and running. So I didn't start with, Cure, uh, you know, yeah, luckily, truly found me and they could have found anybody else. But it's not easy. It takes a long time. It cost a lot of money and that was us trying to get one grow room, grow room up and running right so so it takes time right so i think i think with that said you know some of the questions about you know i, I saw some q a folks having concerns with giving you know cure relief and the likes kind of first mover advantage i know that's super controversial so this is my opinion right if and i know some folks have already answered i'll try to answer this if we don't give existing operators first mover advantage it's going to take another year and a half to two years once the regulations are written for any, any product to become available, right? And I think the way the regulations are written, which is good, is that it's gonna cap Cure Leaf and, and, and the rest of the folks on the number of stores and then and the, the, how much we can grow, right? If, if there wasn't a cap on grow, yeah, we could we could try to grow everything in New York, right? But that's gonna cost us billions and billions, right? And even Cure Leaf doesn't have billions and billions. So what's gonna happen with the, with the, with the, with the supply which I think is something to keep in mind for, for other operators looking to get into the market, right? The supply is gonna go like this, right? Like, you know, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, right? Or sorry, the, you know, demand rather, sorry. You know, the demand is gonna increase over year. Existing operators gonna be capped out here. So we can only support and supply the first sliver of what the market needs because we're gonna be capped out, you know, 
and, and first of all, we don't even know what the cap is, right? So let's say it's 100,000 square feet of canopy, which is a lot. It's going to be expensive to be built, build out. It's going to take purely two years to get it up and running. But, but, but even with first move advantage, it's going to still take us two years to get that far, right? So, but if even if all the existing operators max out at whatever the canopy is, we're only going to be able to supply, let's call it a third or a quarter of the market. So now you're going to have all these incremental operators trying to come in and, 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 and supply the market, which is needed. Without them, New York has zero chance of meeting the future demand of the market, right? So I think it's important, in my opinion, for existing operators to try to get the rigid, you know, just the bare bones market stood up, right? Otherwise, you know, the program's gonna be put on hold for two years and, and until it's it's deemed, all right, now we have enough supply, whatever that might be, all right? But I think the point, if, the, if, if we want the programs to get stood up early, you need the existing operators to try to, to, try to supply the initial demand, which is gonna, in turn, get some tax revenue going, right? Like you're going to start being able to collect money that's going to help, you know, fund some of the social equity applicants. If you don't stand up the market and everybody's, you know, puts their hand in the pockets until they determine, all right, now we're ready as a collective, it's just going to take a long time. So I think, you know, I know it's not a popular opinion, but I think, you know, allowing existing operators to just fund the bare bones of the market, I think is a, a very important step one. And then, you know, as important is now quickly trying to figure out how do we get funding available to the new operators to help continue to supply what is going to be kind of an unmet market, you know, incrementally year over year over year. Right. So so kind of to answer, your, you know, the, 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 the question is, surely will have excess capacity to supply some of the market, as will probably every other operator, because the medical market has been somewhat stagnant over the last you know year, let's say. Right, because a lot of people are holding out for the list of the market. So yeah, we will have excess product that we're going to try to make available to new operators. We're going to prioritize, you know, social equity applicants that will have a standalone store that's looking to get product. And you know, we do we do this pretty 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 typically. Like we'll make product available to them for free. You know, with a very extended line of credit. They don't have to come up with the funding early on to bring product in. They'll be able to put on their shelf for free and then pay us. You know, when it when it sells through. But so. We, like I said, we will have product early on, but as the market grows, without additional canopy coming from not just Cureleaf, all these other cultivators that are looking to come online, that demand is is is, is not going to be met, because like I said, it's going to take that much that much time to kind of get stood up. So I think that's the first one, and I think in general, like like having New York, you know, legalized cannabis. I mean, New York is such a it's such a you know hub of of the universe, right? I think this it's going to be. It's going to be California. It's going to be New York. It's going to be Colorado. I think those are maybe the top three markets. You know, probably Florida would be you know a, a strong candidate there too to be kind of round out the top four. But you know, you know, what, I think what happens in New York is going to be just a, a kind of the the, the 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 microcosm of the rest of the world. So if if New York goes adult use and in everybody else sees the success, yes, it's very much going to you know decrease the stigma of cannabis. You're going to see a lot of other states. You know, when you once you start, you know, rec, you know, publishing how much tax revenue you're going to get from this. I mean, there's there's so many benefits from this program getting stood up. So, you know, like I said, my, my only concern is we're just going to make sure we do it the right way and we try to do it in a, in a way that you know get, doesn't delay too much, but also creates opportunities for social equity applicants to quickly enter the market. You know, I think uh, Jill, I think Patrick makes a really good point that's really important about and and I think I saw one comment that someone thinks that I'm I'm not bullish on New York. It's not that I've just been through. And I think anyone who's been through the states that I've been through has seen everything. I mean, my first license, I won one of the four Connecticut, you know, Cureleaf is named for a Connecticut company. It was originally called something different. Patrick could tell you about Palliatech and Cureleaf's life. I was one of the operators in Connecticut alongside uh, Cureleaf and Connecticut had no patience. I mean, so everyone who thinks like the MSOs are just going to come in and swamp the market. No, things happen. What I do think you could do, and, and my frustration with New York is that they started from scratch and this has been brewing for five or six years. And it still think, seems like they're throwing out trial balloons on how to get as much tax as possible and how to make as much license fee as possible. They could easily say all existing ROs are allowed to start operating. When we give out social equity licenses for either retail or manufacturing, a certain amount of that product has to go to them on credit or otherwise so that they can introduce their own brands. Now all of a sudden you have social equity applicants with very little capital introducing products into the market. And also it allows the MSOs or the, the nine existing plus attain who, who's not an MSO per se. I, I know they just want a New Jersey license, but it allows them to work out the kinks in the market so that when people operate, like MSOs have money to deal with compliance and stuff. 
And so better to let them figure out what's going to go wrong with the program first before you actually introduce people who have less cushion, less capital, and the state starts putting money to work in the social equity program. So it's not that I'm not positive on New York. I think that New York has a blank slate and some of the ideas that are being proposed that seem like they're starting to become hardwired into the law don't seem to make sense from a pragmatic perspective, especially if the goal is to do two things, have a safe and legal industry and undo the damage from the war on drugs, then there are very specific things you can do at the programmatic level to accomplish that. And those don't start with taxation. Those don't start with over-regulation. Those don't start with having no flip the switch for the existing operators. Those start with having a more inclusive industry that means getting on the ground running, having adult use functioning so you have more, you have more consumers, more consumers means more that let the people that are existing build the consumer base because brand loyalty, Patrick will tell you, you know, anyone operating in space will tell you, brand loyalty is very itinerant in cannabis. If you, if you have a good product, people are going to use it regardless. There's no Coca-Cola yet. There's no people, you know, you don't have to run. It, it's not the hardest industry if you have a good product. So Thank that's you. what I would just say. And I had a, a couple of things because I feel like I was the bearer of some bad news with the taxation. I do see some very positive things happening in New York. You know, the $200 million fund that New York is allocating to the social equity applicants to give them a, a little bit of a head start is very, very positive. I do see a lot of companies like, you know, Markham is doing it. Here I am. I don't mean to do a commercial, but we are looking at how we can help these companies comply and do it, the software. And New York also has this bill in that they're trying to decouple from 280E. That is huge. That is tremendous. So there's a lot of positive things. This is very exciting. I, you know, if we could all say something positive, I like to end on a positive note that this is still yes. wonderful. Yes, Thanks things are moving that. along. The OCM has a great board ahead of it. And I think a lot of really good things are happening and I'm totally excited about it. So I think we should end with positive stuff. <laughs> Can we Absolutely. go around um, and, uh, and, and, and be there? All of us can support the industry and be advisors and do what we can to help this industry. So I, I think, thank you so much for that. And thank you all for, you know, being here today, uh, you know, for this wonderful uh, discussion. And like all new businesses, they have growing pains and I'm sure we'll get through them. But uh, the good news is there's tremendous opportunity uh, both for the small and the large operators. And uh, you are the you know, leaders in this industry, um, especially in New York, and can be extremely helpful in making sure that it goes uh, in the right direction for you know, everyone who is looking to take part. So I, with that, I just want to thank you, um, you know, just to, to keep on schedule. I know everybody has... Uh, a lot of things to do. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you so much for all of you being here and having this spirited conversation of such a very important topic. So thank you for taking out your time and providing us with this information. I want to thank all of our attendees for joining us and being part of this conversation. We hope to have many more like this. Um, it's a it's an evolving process, and um, we really appreciate you all being here. Yes. Thank you so much. We want to wish you all to stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.